Good afternoon. Welcome to IPI for this afternoon's discussion. My name is Sarah Taylor. I am the lead on Women, Peace, and Security here at IPI. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you for this policy forum on toward a more effective UN-AU partnership on conflict prevention and crisis management. This policy forum aims to discuss the evolution of the strategic partnership between the UN and the AU, with a specific focus on how they undertake conflict prevention and crisis management efforts. These discussions come two weeks after the 13th joint consultative meeting between the UN Security Council and the AU Peace and Security Council, convened in Addis Ababa, and one week after the UN Security Council's annual debate on the UN-AU partnership. We are also using this platform today to launch, launch a policy paper jointly produced by IPI and the Institute for Security Studies. I recommend that you all have a copy. It's also available online. Um, the paper is titled Toward a More Effective UN-AU Partnership on Conflict Prevention and Crisis Management. On behalf of these two organizations, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and the Training for Peace program for their support to this project, as well as to the AU Permanent Observer Mission to the UN for its partnership over the past year. To begin our conversation, I am delighted to welcome two distinguished colleagues to provide brief opening remarks. First, we will hear from Ambassador Jerry Matthews Matjila, Permanent Representative from the Permanent Mission of the Republic of South Africa to the United Nations, and then, then from Ambassador Od Inge Kvalheim, Deputy Permanent Representative of Norway to the United Nations. We will then open, of course, with our, we will then turn to our distinguished panel. So, Ambassador, you have the podium for your opening remarks. <laughs> Uh, thanks first, thanks very much for um, for invitation and thanks for the distinguished um, 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 podium and colleagues. Um, I was asked to um, to make some few remarks on the AU Africa cooperation. But first maybe let me make remarks on um, how we as South Africa approached the presidency of the Security Council, what informed uh, our thinking and why we sought to put into place the kind of uh, deliverables that um, we proposed before the Council. Um, first of all, I think um, you'll hear a lot from uh, my bosses, uh, Ambassador Fatima about the AU uh, UN cooperation and uh, from the veteran uh, uh, Keita about the actual field uh, work and then of course the researchers there. Now, you know, you know, Saragu is a very small country at the bottom of Africa, very, very far away from civilization, very, very far from where things happen. Now, people normally very far think, and then you try to imagine what is happening thousands of kilometers away. So it helps to stretch your imagination, but sometimes also it helps you to focus, because if your imagination is stretched, you have to focus on that work. So we chose three pillars of our presidency. First of all, it was where this tiring figure called Nelson Mandela, and in, in his own imagination and idealism, uh, proposed uh, to do something about a peaceful world, how to contribute towards a peaceful world, and what characterized this peaceful world. So we say living the legacy could be one of the contribution. The second part of it was this massive continent and look at it from South Africa, you know, you can see this huge landmass ahead of you, full potential, very full potential. Uh, it has people, it has uh, resources, it has nature, it's vast. And at the top of it, next, sit next to 
to Europe, to Middle East, uh, to great civilizations of all our times. And then we have this um, Agenda 2063, the roadmap towards a peaceful, stable Africa. Then how do we interact with that? So part of our thinking as South Africa was, let's look into what we can do in two years. Because you are just tourists. You know, in two years, you are tourist security council. Then you are off. And the big guys look at you. Uh, you come in, they see, are you going to ruffle the feathers? Are you going to disturb the apple cut? Are you going to float and beyond? Now, South Africans normally don't um, uh, want to be like tourists. Of course, we have very beautiful tourist spots in South Africa. But uh, we normally want to make some input. So we said, let's look into the issue of women and youth as a motive force of change for the better. If you organize this huge resource in the continent around certain ideas and channel the energy, you may shift the file of peace, stability, slightly further. Now, if you look in the African continent, you can see there are zones of peace emerging. In the Horn of Africa, Central Africa, you can see there are uh, spheres of zones. If you just make an extra push, you can, you know, you know, you can, you can improve the frontiers of peace in the continent. How do we do that? Let's bring the youth that's why on the 2nd of October, second day, we had um, a signature event on peace and, Af peace and security in Africa, mobilizing young people to silence their guns by 2020. And then you have the youth from Kenya, from Uganda, from Tunisia to come and give evidence on how the young people can be part of this motive force of change in the corner, they are creative, they are energy, but also in some cases are slightly diverted. So, so we started to deal with the question of youth and security. And so at the end of this, let's get a PRST. Because 2020 also is a theme for Africa, silencing their guns. What role can young people play in their own future in the continent? And then on the 7th of October, Peace, Security Africa, Preventive Diplomacy, Negotiation and Peace. And again, we went it for that because there are a cluster of uh, situation in Africa where you see that agreements being signed. The, well, the South Sudan, you saw the one now in uh, Sudan, there's a roadmap. In Central African Republic, it's an agreement be signed. What is lacking is implementation. How do we move with implementation of this agreement? Mm -hmm. Somalia is roadmap towards the elections. Actually, if you look through Ethiopia, Eritrea, it's an agreement implementing it. If you look through various ports in our continent, even across in Yemen, you have um, uh, agreements in Yemen. Syria, you have uh, Geneva process. Uh, Yemen, you have Stockholm process. Uh, Haiti, we just had lowering the, the flag of the UN. So there are a lot of agreements uh, that has been signed. How do we push this towards uh, uh, realization uh, and hopefully enabling people to enjoy peace? And of course, the, the first signature event was the issue of women, peace, and security. The rest was towards the closure of our presidency where, again, you saw massive 100 countries want to speak uh, over subscribe issue with a very good outcome with a resolution that focused on implementation. Because we said you had nine resolutions since 1325. Nine. What is left? Implementation. Because we need to create a bridgehead, a base, to celebrate 1325 in 2020 as part of an overall 75th anniversary of the United Nations. You, you should have a different world 75 years on 
Is it different? Where are the women in 75 years history of the United Nations? Or actually, put differently, where should they be the next 25 years towards 100th anniversary of the United Nations? So what can we do as South Africa to make sure that as we move into celebrations, we create a prom base for the next 25 years so that by the time we say we have 100 years of the UN, the world has changed. Women are part and parcel of the, the key decision-making activities of the world. And I believe, uh, I think men agree, to be a better world when you have more women leadership, me and you take a back seat, you know. Uh, more and more resources are with women, more and more um, um, major things are with them. So that was the part of idealistic South African approach to the president of the city council. Was it idealistic or was it appropriate in the backdrop of um, a surge in Africa of the women, peace and security? There is a, there is a huge <coughs> surge in the continent about women, peace and security. So that was our approach. So we had 44 meetings we organized uh, as South Africa, 44 meetings, uh, excluding the six days we spent in Africa, just, just at the UN, uh, 44 meetings. Um, and now you can ask me, how did you come with 44 meetings in three weeks? Uh, but it just shows the expectations to the world on the role little countries can play. Uh, this is unprecedented to have 44 meetings at the, at the, at the Security Council. How, what is the outcomes? You can look, there was, um, I think, five resolutions, a number of APRSTs, eight press statements. There was a lot of half of activity around this issue. Now, the message for South Africa was very simple. Do not undermine the tension within the Security Council. Secondly, uh, remain focused, tenacious, go for it, and uh, develop uh, stamina day and night. Third, have your negotiators everywhere. You know, I had a team of 16, 16 full time on the school to cousin, 16. They were everywhere, everywhere. Make sure that any resolution, any PRS, any statement, they are there. Third, coordinate especially the African three as a background of your intervention. So the A3 in 10, month, 10 months had 13, one three common statement. <coughs> one three, you never had that before. The A3 had among itself 13 common statement. The last one was read by my minister on the um, AU, UN cooperation. They say you read it. Now, the A3 became like uh, something you have to cross, whether you're a P5 or not, you have to cross A3 on African issues. Why? Because they were united. But also, there was the A3, AU, PAC, continuous coordination through VTC all the time. So you have two centers, New York, Addis, coordination on African issues. And to make sure that uh, we can streamline, sequence, <coughs> coordinate our positions and reinforce one another. Of course, not uh, in all issues. And because of this, we then said, let's have a trip to Africa. Uh, um, went to Sudan to try to push the Sudanese uh, players towards November 12th, hmm? okay. South Sudan. She always remind me to South Sudan. So we went to South Sudan. 
uh, co-lead uh, myself and um, my colleague from the US. We co-lead and uh, we spent the whole day there. Had six meetings. We landed in the morning from Nairobi at nine, we had six o'clock, but in that six o'clock, we went flat out without lunch. We had lunch in the aircraft on our route to Addis. That's when we had lunch. So, so part of that was to make sure that uh, we meet civil society, we meet youth, we meet women, we meet all signatories to the revitalized agreement. And then, of course, we have discussions with uh, President his cabinet and uh, with uh, Dr. Rick Marshall. So that was part of that uh, trying to push parties to implement the agreement uh, going forward. So Fatima will say the rest. I just wanted to share with you because I'm, I'm, I'm told I'm giving three minutes and I'm talking about seven minutes. They're looking at me, you know. So that was how we, we go. But we still believe that certain issues can be um, mainstream into the UN work. Some can be mainstream in our present coming forward. But um, in all this work, it could have been impossible uh, not to have a monthly meeting with uh, Kate and uh, Beans. She's not here, Gawanas. And Ambassador Fatima and the AU Observer Mission, I saw Idris Zier. They became the secretariat of the A3. So the secretariat has a well, well uh, kept records and coordination. And that is what lies behind the strength of the coordination and impact at the Security Council of the A3 because we had a very level secretariat. And above all, the whole UN system led by Secretary General Kuteres and the um, Chairperson Commission of the AU, Faki, threw their weight behind the 8-3 and our presidency. So um, Daniel and colleagues, I, I really want to, 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 to thank you for, for this. Lastly, civil society kept us awake. You know, some of us come from civil society. They want to have a say on everything we do. And of course, we allow them. We got so enriched by civil society, uh, including the said, You see, my name is Jerry. It's very simple. You see, Jerry, if you, you bring women here, we must want to have a say which women you must bring from Africa. Now, you see, I'm an African. Uh, but the European women tell me which women you must bring. You must see the role of civil society. I think you know by now. Very strong. So they say, okay, we'll get you a youth activist. Then they brought, they say, okay, Jerry, here is the name. Alasal, we want her here to make an input. So this is the beauty of working with the civil society. So we had 10 women briefers during our presidency, 10. Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, South Sudan, Tunisia, Central African Republic, we had women from all these parts of the world to come and brief during our presidency. And only two guys. Uh, thank you very much. The rest will be said by then. <laughs> thank you so much, Ambassador Matilia. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, great uh, to, to be here. Uh, I thank you not only for your introduction here, but also, uh, although we are a bit out in uh, November already, uh, for your presidency in October. We, we know uh, how uh, time consuming and what a big job it is to successfully guide uh, the work of the Security Council through a whole month. And uh, we're particularly pleased with the meeting that you were referring to also on women, peace and security. Um, our uh, foreign minister was very honored to take uh, part in that. So uh, well done. And it's good to be here, uh, not only because uh, it's so appropriate to be next to a fireplace for a Norwegian uh, this time of year, <laughs> but also uh, this is a theme that is very important to, to Norway, and uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be in the company of such a distinguished uh, panel. Um, 
and uh, I would say also add that it's an appropriate date uh, for us as Norwegians, as uh, I know there's taking place a Nordic African uh, Foreign Ministers meeting in Dar es Salaam today. Anyway, um, when it comes to the topic of uh, today, uh, I'd like to start to say uh, something very general. For a small country like Norway, looking at peace and security, there's fundamentally two very different avenues to be that one can uh, pursue. One is to focus on ourselves and our borders and our areas close by and, and uh, think that that is 100% uh, focus on that is what will keep us safe and the focus on the Norwegian citizens and so on. A different avenue uh, for a small country is to uh, choose to, to be engaged on the world stage, to see where you can find uh, a niche, where you have something to contribute. And uh, in the belief, um, with the clear conviction, that uh, contributing to our common uh, security is also a way of safeguarding our own security. And you can imagine which avenue, I believe, Norway has uh, chosen among those two. But I think it's a little bit of a backdrop to the, uh, the question that some might pose, what in the world is Norway doing in being involved in supporting uh, the cooperation between the UN and the African uh, Union? I'd like to say a little bit on a personal note too that uh, my last posting was in uh, Addis Ababa as an Af uh, ambassador to the African Union. And so it's, it's, very, uh, it's a good perspective uh, for me to have seen... Uh, a little bit of this cooperation seen from two different perspectives, from the Addis perspective and from New York perspective. Anyway, I'm pleased to, to be here today for this policy forum to discuss the partnership of the UN and the African Union on the joint efforts on conflict prevention and crisis management. We were pleased to see the launch of the report towards a more effective UN-AU partnership on conflict prevention and crisis management, the one that was shown to you in the introduction, <laughs> in Addis Ababa not long ago, and I would like to thank both IP, IPI and ISS. I said ICC the whole morning, ISS for their excellent work. It's an institute I'm quite familiar with uh, from uh, my previous uh, postings as well. Uh, does a lot of important work. The importance of strengthening the UN-AU partnership has been recognized many times. The joint UN-AU framework for enhanced partnership on peace and security is an important step forward. So is the African Union United Nations framework for the implementation of Agenda 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But perhaps even more important are the immense cooperative efforts that are being done on the ground on peace, in peace operations on the African continent and in efforts to reach peace agreements and as report states in prevention and crisis management. Relations between the UN and the AU are maturing and growing stronger, but what more can be done to support this? We believe that cooperation and regional organizations is essential for the work of the UN. Regional organizations have complementary capacities that can strengthen efforts in prevention and management of conflict. For Norway, this is one of the reasons why it is a priority to support the partnership between the UN and the African Union. We are pleased to provide financial and political backing to strengthen the partnership. As many of you know, a group of friends of the UN-AU partnership was established in Addis Ababa in May. The purpose of the group of friends is to help uh, promote and further strengthen the partnership address issues of common interest between the UN uh, and the AU, and provide member state and partner support on an operational and political level. The group of friends in Addis is still young, but I believe the benefit of having such a group uh, has already uh, shown uh, its merits. It is a place for discussion where member states of the AU and the UN are able to give input and comments but it's also a place for briefings and information sharing on current processes and developments within and between the two organizations. Now back to the report, the report towards a more effective UN-AU partnership on conflict prevention and crisis management. 
this valuable tool in understanding better the dynamics between the UN and the AU in prevention and crisis management efforts. And maybe also guide not only the UN and the AU in the future efforts, but also point out where support from others is needed. We are committed to replicate the group of friends uh, from others here in New York, based on interest from member states, the UN and AU. Norway is, together with Egypt, in the process of establishing, establishing a group of friends that can be used to foster better communication, more information sharing, and a place for frank and constructive discussions on interest uh, for the partnership. I very much look forward to listening to the coming speakers and to hear from the AU-UN partnership experts on how we can support in the best way. Thank you. My multiple roles mean that I'm running from one side of the room to the other. Again, welcome. Thank you to both ambassadors so much for that rich and interesting discussion. Um, as the Women, Peace, and Security lead, as you know, I was very uh, invested in your presidency. And so I think I hadn't caught up on the fact that it was actually 10 women speakers. I think that that's, that that's wonderful for the, for the month, so thank you. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity now to introduce the panel. Uh, you have their full bios in on the blue sheets that you can find, um, I believe, in the back of the room. So I won't go into too much detail. Uh, to begin with, we will have Daniel Forti and Priyal Singh discussing the analysis and recommendations from their report, as we've already mentioned. Daniel is a policy analyst here at IPI's Br Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations, and Priyal is a researcher at the ISS Peace Operations and Peace Building Program. After their presentations, we are incredibly fortunate to hear from two of the senior officials who are directly leading on the UN-AU partnership in peace and security. Uh, I'm really looking forward to their discussion of key aspects of that UNAU partnership in terms of conflict prevention and crisis management and their reflections on notable issues that have emerged from the, from the earlier presentations. The first of our two distinguished colleagues will be Ambassador Fatima Kiari Mohammed, who is the African Union's permanent observer to the United Nations. She presented her credentials in March 2018 and has previously served as a senior special advisor to the Commission of the Economic Community of West African States and is a um, very welcome repeat guest and uh, speaker here at IPI. Uh, Ms. Bintu Keita is the Assistant Secretary General for Africa in the United Nations Departments of Political Affairs and Peacebuilding and Peace Operations. Ms. Keita has served in a range of positions across the UN including previously as the, the Deputy Joint Special Representative for the African Union UN Hybrid Operation in Darfur. Welcome back again to IPI. After their presentations, we will have time, we should have time for one or two rounds of questions and answers. We will conclude our discussions then with brief closing remarks from Mr. Gustavo de Carvajal, whose name I probably just butchered, uh, my apologies, um, Spanish, not Portuguese, uh, senior re a researcher at ISS. So that's absolutely enough for me. I'm delighted to hand over to Daniel and Priyal. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, all protocols observed. Um, over the next few minutes, Priyal and I will briefly summarize the analysis and the recommendations from our report, and we look forward to an engaging discussion thereafter. Our focus on the UN-AU partnership comes at a time when conflict prevention is a priority for both organizations, but neither has the political, financial, or and operational tools to prevent conflicts or manage crises on their own. In addition, recent discussions about the UN-AU partnership have disproportionately revolved around peacekeeping issues, even when their collaboration spans a far larger set of areas of cooperation. So our report analyzes the partnership on conflict prevention and crisis management in particular, and we focus on this at three different levels. Dynamics amongst member states, dynamics between the UN Secretariat and the AU Commission, and thematic areas where the prior partnership demonstrates tangible impact on the ground. My remarks will provide highlights from those first two sections, while Priyal will cover the latter and summarize our recommendations. 
One important analytical and methodological note, while our report does incorporate some analysis of the role that regional economic commissions and uh, regional mechanisms, regional economic communities, uh, play in the partnership, we do make a dedicated focus to, fo to, to prioritize the UNAU dimensions of these areas. So first, starting with the member state dynamics, really council to council relations are a central driver of the UN-AU partnership and how the organizations work together on these areas. The AU Peace and Security Council is the only continental member body state that regularly engages the UN Security Council in a structured and systematic manner and is therefore uniquely privileged compared to other multilateral organizations. The growth in their partnership since 2007 is noteworthy, but it is still defined by an overriding tension. The two councils are increasingly interdependent, but remained locked in a relationship that is fundamentally unequal in terms of powers, authority, resources, and political status. While this tension emerges frequently in the context of peace operations, the two councils have managed to cooperate somewhat more effectively on crisis management and conflict prevention areas. An informal division of labor has emerged, where the AU Peace and Security Council mandates the AU Commission, or a REC, to assume political leadership over a file, and the UN Security Council provides support as a guarantor to sustain international attention and pressure. Recent examples of this kind of cooperation in terms of the Central African Republic, the Gambia, Sudan, and even currently Guinea-Bissau demonstrate this kind of cooperation strongly. The spirit of cooperation, however, is most often impacted by each council's own internal political dynamics, which makes it challenging to achieve consensus between the bodies. On any given situation, efforts by one or more member states to assert their national interests or their ownership of a particular file can heavily influence discussions within and between the two councils. The greater frequency of political initiatives outside the purviews of both councils can also reduce the scope for effective coordination. Political dynamics surrounding conversations on Cameroon and on Libya can epitomize these kinds of challenges. In addition, uneven diplomatic capacities and bandwidth amongst member states on both councils can impede effective collaboration. Council-to-council -council conversations require their member states to have active presences in both New York and in Addis Ababa. Strength and representation could help them better triangulate with their capitals to ensure accurate analysis and to better understand the working methods and nuances that define each council's day to day. As Ambassador Majila mentioned, the African three members of the UN Security Council are envisioned as a bridge between the two bodies. They are our strongest coalition when unified and backed with clear positions from the AU Peace and Security Council. And joint efforts from the A3 can clearly influence the UN Security Council strategies on Africa files, which in 2018 constituted 50% of its total work. Divisions amongst the A3 on Africa-specific files, although exceedingly rare, have increased over the past 10 years. Um, and we've calculated approximately eight times out of 298 different resolutions since 2010. These divisions often relate to issues that are similarly divisive within the AU Peace and Security Council, most notably on Western Sahara and the use of sanctions. The annual joint consultative meeting between the two councils, which the 13th edition concluded two weeks ago, is perhaps the most visible symbol of their cooperation. We found that recent efforts to improve the qualities of these engagements, including through expert level pre-visits, the informal seminar that takes one place one day before, and the streamlining of discussions have been useful as was the case in 2018. Nonetheless, these consultations will not achieve their full potential until the agreements reflected in joint communiques clearly guide future decisions by each council. Finally, we highlight the importance of more frequent council level engagements outside of the annual consultation. Our report discusses efforts to align monthly agendas, briefings by each organization to the other's council, and possibilities for joint UN Security Council, AU Peace and Security Council missions, which was another subject that featured prominently two weeks ago in Addis. Secondly, like the relationship between the two councils, the partnership between the UN Secretariat and the AU Commission, while it remains a work in progress, it has grown considerably in recent years. 
While the 2017 framework, as Sarah and Ambassador Magellan highlighted, provides a policy foundation for cooperation on a range of these issues, stronger engagements are equally driven by political impetus and personal relationships. I specifically want to touch on two aspects of this partnership, the, the formal partnership mechanisms and day-to-day -day working level relationships. We found that the political impetus placed on the UN-AU partnership by Secretary General Gutierrez and Commission Chairperson Faki are important drivers of closer relations. While I instituted the UN-AU annual conference only in 2017, their informal conversations, tete-a-tetes, and joint statements on specific country situations send unambiguously positive messages throughout their organizations and to other partners. The Joint Task Force on Peace and Security and the annual desk-to-desk -desk meetings help provide long-term structure and sustainability to this growing partnership. Each mechanism helps build relationships amongst officials and to better align priorities and messaging on specific country files. Our research also highlights areas where both of these tools can be strengthened. And while these mechanisms are important, in reality, the UN-AU partnership depends just as much on day-to-day -day collaboration, both in headquarters and in the field. Cooperation at the working level has progressed in recent years, as the political commitment from the organization's principles filters down, with many desk officers now trying to catch up. Nonetheless, this progress is uneven and varies depending on the file and individual relationships at hand. So the two organizations continue to navigate how best to complement each other in practice, as well as the bureaucratic friction inherent to coordinating the activities of two large organizations. We acknowledge that the UN and the AU often possess complementary strengths in conflict prevention and crisis management areas. The AU often has more legitimacy to engage national or regional actors and can therefore access more political entry points before or after a crisis emerges. With its global mandate for international peace and security and its diverse field presences, the UN has more operational and logistic capabilities along with a more predictable budget. These comparative advantages can often color how day-to-day -day interactions unfold. So our analysis discusses a range of tools, processes, and dynamics that can support or complicate these interactions. Some of them are more operational, including the role of partnership focal points, the greater use of joint activities, and the need to balance systematic working level interactions with ensuring that joint decisions are reflected in long-term plans. In particular, the UN Office to the African Union and the AU Permanent Observer Mission here in New York are crucial entry points for strengthening these day-to-day -day relationships. We also discuss some of the longer term points of bureaucratic friction and how differences in each organization's structure, resources, and relationship with their member states can impact the partnership's efforts. These uh, dynamics often force the UN and the AU to play a difficult balancing act. Um, importantly, we encourage an expanded conception of the partnership beyond headquarters, reflecting on how it unfolds in different country settings. We acknowledge that the UN, the AU, and the RECs consistently deploy officials to the same country level areas. Uh, we have a map in the back of our reports, and there's a, a map provided by the UN in these areas as well. We also found that in-country collaboration is influenced by each organization's mandate and political capital, by financial, logistic, and human resources, and by specific individuals who represent these organizations. Notably, collaboration between the UN, AU, and SADC in support of 20, Madagascar's 2018 elections is an exemplary demonstration of this collaboration, not least because the organizations learned important lessons from the challenges they faced years earlier in achieving the same goals. And with that, I'll turn over to my colleague and co-author, Priyal. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> um, so just building on Daniel's um, overview, I will summarily discuss some of the most clear opportunities and encouraging developments between the AU and UN, specifically as these relate to key thematic dimensions of the partnership. Following from the 2017 Joint UN-AU Framework for Enhanced Partnership in Peace and Security, our research focusing on the key thematic, our um, focusing on the key thematic dimensions of the partnership accordingly considered a broad set of issues and six areas in particular. 
while the, there are, of course, many other thematic areas to consider, we believe that these were largely reflective of the general scope of the partnership. Given our focus, however, on how the partnership can specifically contribute to more effective conflict prevention and crisis management, our research naturally shifted toward the AU's Silencing the Guns Initiative and how a more impactful UN-AU partnership could strengthen this initiative moving forward. The most significant issue here is that the Silencing the Guns Initiative, by way of its existing policy documents, already provides guidance for UN and UN actors to interface more regularly on key conflict prevention priorities and potential programmatic steps for collective implementation. The 2016 Master Roadmap of Practical Steps to Silence the Guns by 2020, for example, specifically speaks to the UN-AU partnership in terms of the need for greater AU PSC and UN Security Council exchanges on conflict prevention and the appointments of A3 member states as penholders and co-penholders on uh, Security Council files concerning the continent's peace and security. As a clear tool to mobilize AU, AU member state support around conflict prevention, it is also encouraging to see that A A3 member states have increasingly championed this initiative at the UN, as seen by the example set by Equatorial Guinea, which championed the adoption of Resolution 2457 during its Council Presidency Month earlier this year. In spite of these positive developments, however, much more could be done to leverage this initiative toward the achievement of more tangible and specific commitments from UN and AU actors. Hopefully, the establishment of two independent task forces by the UN Secretariat and the AU Commission aimed at aligning these priorities and consolidating inter-institutional conflict prevention efforts will feed directly into either organization's implementation of the initiative beyond 2020. Regardless, the, the establishment of these task forces is a positive development in and of itself, given the potential opportunities for great engagement between UN uh, and AU actors, specifically on conflict prevention, as framed within the Silencing the Guns initiative. Moreover, the fact that this was a standing agenda item during the recently concluded Council to Council joint working visit is encouraging as this maintains a clear shared political commitment to the broader conflict prevention agenda between the two organizations. Mediation is another critical uh, dimension of the partnership. As a cornerstone of effective preventive diplomacy and crisis management, mediation is generally regarded as one of the more advanced dimensions of UNAU engagements. Having formally and informally engaged uh, in such efforts in countries like Burundi, the Central African Republic, Madagascar, and Liberia, amongst others, the two organizations have developed robust institutional mechanisms that have worked very well in prior years. Of particular importance here is that either organization maintains clear comparative advantages in the area of mediation which spans a diverse array of tools and mechanisms, which include, for example, the appointment of special envoys, the UN's mediation support unit, the AU's panel of the wise, the UN's Secretary General's high-level advisory board on mediation, and of course, most recently, the AU's own mediation support unit, amongst various others. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, there are numerous entry, existing entry points and institutional uh, nodes for greater and more meaningful engagements on mediation by both organizations. A key challenge here, however, is unsurprisingly one that concerns coordination and coherence, as well as the issue of political primacy and subsidiarity. These challenges are further complicated when considering the roles of the regional economic communities and regional mechanisms in leading their own mediation efforts. The UN-AU partnership must therefore account for this heterogeneous nature of the various political institutions involved in mediation, as well as these various mandates, capacities, and comparative advantages. Women, peace, and security uh, is, of course, another key entry point for more meaningful UN-AU cooperation. At a council level, the, the AU and UN have both accelerated their respective engagements on this issue through the adoption of various resolutions, the establishment of uh, numerous initiatives and processes, uh, and the appointments by the AUPSC of the Special Envoy on Women, Peace, and Security. 
encouraging the adoption of national action plans uh, to implement this resolution has also gained increasing momentum in recent years by both councils, while senior UN and AU officials have increasingly coordinated their actions on a common agenda. Uh, the recently concluded joint high-level solidarity visit uh, on women, peace, and security uh, is, of course, emblematic of this encouraging trend and follows from other well-coordinated joint UN-AU missions uh, between the AU Special Envoy and the UN uh, DSG to South Sudan, Niger, and Chad. Uh, this agenda is also situated, similarly to mediation, across a very wide and very diverse range of inter-institutional nodes, uh, including the AU's Women, Gender, and Development Directorates, the Gender, Peace, and Security Program within the PSD, the FEMWISE Mediation Network alongside UN Women, which leads the UN's efforts on women, peace, and security, uh, of course, in support of the Secretariat's various other departments and offices that also play a key role. Accordingly, while opportunities for more impactful UN AU engagements on this agenda are plentiful, the challenge again, however, is how well these engagements are coordinated and managed to ensure collective coherent strategies and responses to advance this agenda. Our report delves into uh, these key thematic areas in much greater detail and considers a few more areas that offer opportunities for more meaningful cooperation. Based on, on our reading of these relatively recent developments and overarching dynamics, uh, we also provide six key recommendations for concerned stakeholders moving forward, and I'll try and uh, rush through these quite quickly. Uh, of course, these are elaborated uh, much more in much greater detail in the reports, uh, but I will just very briefly uh, touch on them here. Firstly, council-to-council -council engagements need to be prioritized and strengthened. The effectiveness of joint responses to ongoing and potential crises across the continent depends on greater mutual understandings of conflict dynamics and root causes, and the PSC and the UNSC should view their ongoing engagements as critical strategic opportunities to further institutionalize this partnership and focus on tangible outcomes. Secondly, the utility of a common approach to conflict prevention and crisis management cannot be underestimated. As previously discussed, there are numerous institutional nodes that allow for greater and more meaningful interactions. These engagements, particularly at the largely informing working level, need to be strengthened and consolidated within an overarching strategy that ties together the joint planning of certain activities uh, and shared objectives. Common messaging on conflict prevention and crisis management, alongside the potential development of joint work plans, again at the working level, should be more robustly explored to this effect. Thirdly, we propose that a dedicated team within the AU's peace and security department that specifically focuses on the advancements of this partnership should be more seriously explored. While there have been many positive developments aimed at greater coordination with UN actors within the AU PSD, these efforts would nonetheless benefit tremendously from a drive toward greater institutionalization. Fourth, there is a clear need to better align the AU and UN's work on peace, peace building and PCRD. The regular sharing of lessons learned and improved operational collaboration, uh, for example, better institutionalizing engagements between the AU Permanent Observer Mission, the PSC, the Peace Building Commission, could potentially lead to much more coherent policy development processes and on the ground outcomes. Fifth, momentum on, silence, on the Silencing the Guns initiative needs to be maintained uh, through sustained member state political and operational supports. The operationalization of the SDG roadmap provides significant opportunities for AU and UN actors to consolidate and direct their conflict prevention and crisis management efforts within a clear policy framework that already enjoys widespread member states buy-in. Uh, this will, however, require much more clear, concrete guidance from the AU on how this process can practically unfold. Lastly, member states' diplomatic capacities and bandwidth need to be reinforced and strengthened across Addis Ababa and New York. Given the growth and evolution of this partnership uh, in recent years, member states need to recognize that the demands placed upon their respective missions to manage the increasingly taxing workload 
requires a more substantial diplomatic investment, uh, a much more substantial diplomatic investment than in prior years. This is especially true when considering the interface of A3 member states with the AU PSC. Similarly, uh, the AU upon an observer mission and the UN office to the African Union need to remain constantly appraised of the demands required of them as the partnership evolves in an increasingly complex technical multilateral environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, Priyal. Um, I do recommend that you all read the report. It is rich and, and really insightful. Um, so thank you for that Hercule Herculean task of summarizing it. Um, Ambassador Mohammed, your reflections. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Sarah, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow panelists. Um, let me start sincerely by thanking IPI and ISS for organizing this uh, timely event to discuss the partnership between the African Union um, and the UN, and of course their joint uh, um, efforts in conflict, conflict uh, management and, and prevention. And I also want to really thank and commend um, both uh, Daniel and, and Priyal uh, for the efforts they invested in preparing this very comprehensive uh, and very informative, informative report, and I would really um, uh, recommend it, as, as um, Sarah mentioned, um, if you want to learn more about uh, uh, the partnership between the two organizations. Um, on my part, I would say I'm sincerely um, confident that both organizations uh, will draw from the recommendations uh, of this report, and I think it will further strengthen um, this, this promising relationship, particularly in a time where we're being uh, a challenge as far as the relevance of multilateralism and um, multilateral institutions um, are concerned. And I think the scale and the complexity of the challenges that we face today uh, require the harnessing of the collective efforts of uh, all stakeholders. My contributions today will focus on providing um, some updates. Um, I'll try my best not to repeat uh, anything that was already said, but maybe just um, uh, highlight a little bit so we can you know, buttress some of the key, I think, uh, recommendations that came out of this uh, process. Um, so basically what I'd like to do is uh, very quickly talk about um, the AUUN partnership on two levels, first at the council to council level, uh, which was uh, quite well um, elaborated, and then secondly on the commission and secretariat uh, level. Um, and then I will um, conclude by sharing some of our perspectives um, on the way forward, and I'll try and highlight um, some examples uh, as we go along, and as I said, at, at the risk of maybe um, repeating one or two points. Um, so first of all, on the council-to-council -council cooperation, um, this was uh, clearly emphasized in the report and presented um, by um, uh, the, two, uh, the two speakers. Um, this has been a central driver to AU-UN uh, partnership, and the two councils are indeed the policy organs that decide on the mandates, and therefore they are the ones that define the scope of the partnership between the African Union um, and the UN on all security mat matters. Notably, the progress has been, um, there has been progress in this partnership uh, between the Security Council and the um, PSC, um, and particularly, since the establishment of the annual consultations between the two councils. In operational terms, the hybrid operation in Darfur, um, known as UNAMID, and the logistical support package to Amisom are amongst the most prominent examples uh, of the close relationship between the two councils. And this example also highlights the flexibility of the partnership and the capacity to adapt to the demands on the ground. Um, one point I'd like to commend is that the two councils are regularly engaged in joint briefings by senior officials, both on the um, AU Commission side and also uh, on the UN, uh, Security, uh, UN Secretariat side, and this helps to develop a shared understanding of the dynamics on the ground. Um, earlier, Ambassador Jerry mentioned our monthly um, discussions uh, as well. Um, with, uh, of course, ASG um, K10, this has proven to be quite, uh, quite helpful. 
Um, recently, we held the 13th, 13th annual consultations between the two councils, and um, this as well was highlighted by Ambassador Jerry. Um, and I think this really highlighted a very uh, fruitful engagement, but there were very candid discussions, I think, um, on issues, what works, uh, what, what should work but doesn't work, and the potentials of um, better collaboration between, between the two councils. There were, of course, a number of areas of convergence and, of course, diversions um, on both sides. Um, but above all, I would say that the consultations illustrated the fact that both sides are yet to develop or agree on a common understanding within the spirit of, uh, of uh, Chapter 8 of the UN cha Charter. Um, in other words, how we can strike uh, a balance between the primary role of the UN Security Council um, in the maintenance of international peace and security on the one hand, and also efforts uh, of the AU to develop its own capacity and make, make its own contributions to the collective security as provided uh, within the UN chapter on the other hand. So in this context, I think the critical role of the A3 cannot be overemphasized. And I think um, Ambassador Jerry was being a bit, a bit humble <laughs> uh, about the critical role of the A3 and how it serves as a bridge uh, between uh, the two councils. Um, coherence, conformity um, within the A3 and AU decisions on peace and security issues in Africa has been instrumental in building uh, the necessary momentum for African concerns. And these have been, I think, uh, to a good extent, adequately taken into uh, account and addressed um, in, uh, in the Security Council on some levels. Um, but I think the role of the A3 has played has also helped in uh, amplifying the decisions taken by the PSC on very specific um, um, country issues such as Sudan and Libya. And I think this illustrates very well the capacity that they have to assume greater responsibility and continue to um, uh, work as a bridge between the, the two councils. Now, on our part, as the uh, observer mission here um, in New York um, and serving as a secretariat uh, to the A3, um, I think it has, um, with all humility, of course, uh, helped in increasing um, our efforts towards promoting coordinated positions uh, of the A3. Um, but at the same time, we try to make sure that the members are equipped with extensive, um, up-to-date and accurate information on evolving issues uh, on the continent at the level uh, of the AU. And we've also been encouraging greater interactions between the A3 and the uh, PSC to ensure continued support for AU decisions, um, um, uh, and particularly uh, on issues that are on the Security Council agenda. So my second point uh, with respect to uh, collaboration between the Commission and the um, uh, Secretariat. Um, since assumption of office in 2017, um, the chairperson of the AU Commission, uh, His Excellency Musa Faki Mohammed, and uh, the Secretary General uh, of the UN, Antonio Guterres, have really prioritized um, the strengthening of the AU UN partnership in peace and security, particularly in the areas of conflict prevention and sustaining peace. and um, I think it goes beyond, of course, the personalities matter. It's great that they um, agree on a number um, of issues, but uh, it's becoming more and more institutionalized, and I think that really helps uh, overall, uh, particularly in moving forward and ensuring that this is uh, systematic uh, in the future. As far as implementation of the uh, joint framework, um, the two joint frameworks in peace and security, and uh, on development, I think um, there have been positive developments. And um, the impact, I think, is becoming more and more uh, evident. Um, obviously, the frequency of our joint efforts has increased. And uh, we seek effectively to address more and more, um, more complex uh, uh, peace and security challenges on the continent. Um, in, re in the recent period, we've also um, uh, renewed the recognition of the importance of, of ownership, uh, particularly African ownership and priority setting, and the ad adherence of all stakeholders to this um, principle. Um, we've seen uh, successful cases, as was mentioned, um, like Madagascar, Central African Republic, and uh, most recently in, uh, in Sudan. 
And our two organizations have also recorded major milestones in the fields of conflict prevention and crisis management in all of, in all of these cases. Our key achievements um, can also be seen in the joint field uh, visits um, recently, the most recent one, which you'll be happy. <laughs> I mentioned uh, Sarah is on women, peace, and security uh, to the Horn of Africa, and this was headed by um, uh, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed and um, the AU Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, Madame Binata Dio. Um, I was fortunate to be able to join part of this mission uh, in the Horn of Africa. And um, uh, I can really say from my personal um, uh, experience and the perspectives that um, it just kind of re-emphasized more the need to go more and more into the field and um, be able to kind of um, continuously bridge that gap between what we're doing on the policy level and what is really happening on the ground and especially um, get the perspective of uh, people that are working in the field across the board, whether it's on the grassroots level or on the policy level and ensure that you know we bridge that gap between um, policy and, re and reality. Um, of course, the adoption of the recent re resolution um, is, a, is a critical milestone, but as Ambassador Jerry said, the implementation is, is more than anything what, what really matters, and that's uh, post-adoption post implementation is where the work starts. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. I had a, a few other examples that I wanted to mention, but let me just go quickly to my third point and um, conclude from there. Um, so I'd like to just conclude by making four, four uh, key points, uh, key messages. Um, first, and this is also uh, linked to the recommendations that were uh, also made uh, by Priyal. Uh, first is to ensure that the cooperation uh, proceeds in a systematic, principled, and predictable manner. Um, there's an imperative to maintain and respect the principles that underpin the partnership between the two organizations as reflected in our foundation documents, and in this vein, support for African ownership and priority setting cannot be overemphasized. Second, there's a strong imperative to enhance the partnership between the Peace and Security Council and the Security Council, and their cooperation should go beyond the single consultations held annually. Uh, this should be on several levels, uh, including agenda setting, consultations on African issues, field visits, uh, etc. But clearly, a more formal and structured engagement between the two councils is needed and should be encouraged. Thirdly, while increased joint analysis and planning can certainly um, strengthen this partnership, the lack of a joint response uh, and action has been a major source of frustration for both uh, organizations. Uh, joint priorities must be reflected in our joint analysis to um, foster a harmonized approach and yeah, it should result in uh, joint responses in areas where the impact of our partnership is yet to be completely felt. Um, and examples are Libya, the Sahel region, uh, the, Horn of Afri um, the Horn of Africa, and the Great Lakes region. Um, and then finally, um, where um, partnerships are concerned, and I couldn't agree more with this particular recommendation, um, we do not need to reinvent uh, the wheel. I think, uh, especially when it comes to conflict situations on the continent, we already know what is being done, what needs to be done, and what we have um, in, in place. We have to be able to acknowledge the mechanisms that are in place, and we have to make sure that our organizations are working together to ensure joint early and continuous engagement, from early warning to conflict prevention, uh, to mediation and peace support operations, as well as peace building and post-conflict reconstruction and development. Um, and here, uh, to conclude, I'd like to re-emphasize the role of uh, the PBC as well um, and uh, our AU peace building initiatives, particularly within the context of uh, prevention and sustainability. Um, I think not enough attention um, is being given to the potentials there. Um, as we say, you know, very often we think of peace building as post, um, but really it's a before, it's a during, and it's an, it's an after. And in this vein, um, I have to reemphasize our initiative on the silencing the guns, uh, which I'm very happy 
Creel uh, mentioned quite a bit and underlined, it's important to note that this is not a slogan. It is a mantra. We have to keep repeating it. Um, it's about prevention, and I think the international community needs to join us to ensure that we are able to really silence the guns once and for all, not only in Africa, mm -hmm. but globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. A very powerful note uh, to complete your comments. Um, thank you so much. Ms. Keita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for uh, the invitation to join uh, the discussion uh, today uh, on a topic uh, which uh, I'm glad to hear a lot of words which has to do with increase, growth, uh, which means that we are heading in the right direction. Uh, and uh, challenges are always a part of uh, any uh, human endeavor in terms of uh, uh, how we go about it, how we understand each other, and how we uh, surmount also uh, the uh, issues uh, uh, surrounding uh, different uh, types of perspective on the same, on the same issue. Um, so I want to uh, thank everyone, uh, uh, particularly uh, the two ambassadors who introduced uh, the remark, but also the facilitator, the moderator of this uh, conversation, as well as the two uh, co-authors of the uh, uh, report, which I think is very timely. And it is so timely that uh, currently we have our team, uh, which is uh, like uh, inter, uh, inter de departmental interagency uh, right now in Addis, uh, looking and reviewing uh, the partnership between African Union and uh, uh, the uh, uh, United Nations and looking also at uh, our United Nations African Union liaison office based in, uh, in Addis. So I, I think a number of the recommendations and particularly the way they have been highlighted uh, are going to be very useful at the time that we will be discussing the findings of the review uh, of the, that, uh, the strengthening of the cooperation. And there is a number of that, uh, uh, elements that have been said, and I believe that this is quite important as we are going to move forward. Um, now, maybe before I go further in my uh, uh, remarks, I think you all have this uh, with you. Uh, so sh should I show it this way? Uh, so it's a, it's, it, it's a way to capture uh, 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 key information that uh, ones have to have in mind when we are looking at the partnership. So it doesn't mean that everything is here, but at least it gives an idea of what is going on uh, with regard to the uh, partnership. Um, a lot has been said in terms of complexity and scale of what needs to be tackled in the context of the uh, conflict prevention and crisis uh, management. And I don't think I need to repeat it, but however, I liked uh, when uh, in the conversation at the beginning was highlighted that what is very important is the backing, the political backing of member states and also the uh, rendezvous uh, really of the donors in terms of the financial uh, uh, challenges that are uh, uh, emerging from trying to respond to demands that are complex, that are uh, emerging, and also we need investment. So it cannot be a talk where we recognize all the challenges and then when it comes to support, so we don't have the support, we don't have the political backing, we don't have the predictability on the uh, funding that are necessary in order to be able to move forward. So um, in, in, in a sense, I think uh, the, if, I, if I had to describe the uh, partnership, again, I insist that while challenges are there, we have a quantum leap in the way the partnership is going right now. And this since 2017, we can see from all levels, even with the challenges in the daily uh, operation, I think we again are in the right direction. Uh, maybe uh, if uh, uh, I wanted to uh, add uh, some elements, I would say 
we have the political and security uh, pillar, but we also have the development pillar. And I think in your introductory remarks, you also made very sure that we see the linkages between the two, because at the end of the day, it's because of the marginalization, exclusion, discrimination, that some of the conflicts keep coming back and repeated. And we also have the new uh, threats with the terrorism and the violent extremism that we have to take into account, which are now uh, kind of floating uh, through uh, the, the continent and uh, having increased elements around the cross-border dimension and the ability of every single country to tackle the issues with their own uh, budget, which uh, we all know the amount of uh, funding that are going through, uh, through that. Um, and I also uh, would like to uh, um, uh, react on the uh, fact that uh, we uh, have the political level, we have the uh, dialogue level, the policy uh, level. All of this, I think there is one key word which keeps coming, it is a joint. Joint analysis, joint visit, joint communique. This is increasing, so again, it's going in the right direction. When we have tensions, and I think we should be also realistic, there are tensions, and this has been mentioned uh, in uh, uh, what uh, all the co-authors have uh, uh, highlighted, is that I, I call it the crisis of the parenthood, where uh, in certain files, uh, one is claiming uh, being the parent, uh, and uh, uh, there are several parents. So it's no often files. Everyone wants to be the parent of the file, and we have to find a way to lead uh, and agree on how to coalesce and coordinate on uh, uh, such files. And uh, no secret, everyone will be uh, uh, thinking about Libya, but also Western Sahara has been mentioned earlier, and there are so, so other, other files. And probably where we need to grow is uh, in the claiming of the parenthood, is uh, uh, looking at the two council and looking at the way the two council can find a way to pass through and to walk the talk of what we are telling to the political parties uh, uh, in every single country when we say we encourage dialogue, we want you to continue to dialogue, never close the, the, the dialogue. So I believe uh, moving forward, maybe this is what we need more and more in both settings and people ready, member states ready to really go through the bridge uh, in understanding the perspective of each, uh, each, each, each other. And uh, so for me, I'm looking forward to the day that uh, we are walking the talk in terms of uh, what we are preaching to everybody else in terms of dialogue and uh, uh, getting the, uh, <laughs> the, the sense of a common ground and common interest, uh, which is uh, 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 clearly articulated. So in terms of uh, uh, the example, because I was asked to give uh, some example in terms of uh, how we see the uh, African Union-UN partnership uh, in conflict prevention, so clearly, uh, the report has highlighted uh, uh, the, the files, the number of meetings, and uh, I think it's a good way to take stock on where we are. Uh, at the same time, I believe that uh, the, in, in the context of the mediation, which has been highlighted as one key uh, uh, and strong element in the partnership, that we have had our multiple mediation efforts uh, in countries, and we have Burundi as an example, Central Africa Republic, uh, the Comoros, Darfur in Sudan, uh, DRC, uh, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, and Guinea-Bissau today, I think, is one of the high, very high on, on, on the agenda. Uh, but uh, uh, Kenya is another one example. Madagascar has already been mentioned. Mali, Liberia, uh, Libya, uh, in spite of all the challenges, South Sudan and uh, Togo. And coming up soon, we, we, we probably will uh, move from just the Darfur uh, piece of uh, the UNAMID to the discussion on Sudan as the entirety of, uh, of, uh, of Sudan. Um, in the context of uh, the institutional level, a lot has been said already, so I'm not going to, uh, uh, to, to, to dwell there, but I would like to emphasize as a champion uh, during your uh, uh, presidency on uh, walking the talk about women, peace, and security, how it is important in the context of the conflict prevention and the management of the crisis to increase the use 
and utilization of uh, women expertise, particularly through FemWise, but also the youth uh, envoys that we have at both level, the uh, United Nations and also with uh, the uh, uh, African Union. And uh, there, I believe, uh, again, if we are able to do this a bit more, uh, the world may be in a better place. Uh, so you said that uh, for the 100 years uh, coming uh, five years down the line, uh, we should be seeing something different. And uh, for me, I'm looking at the day where I will see uh, the, uh, in the GA, but also in the Security Council, a different picture of what I'm seeing today. So which will mean that the member states are going to be walking the talk in terms of uh, what they are uh, every time in the statement talking about, yes, about the uh, various uh, 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 I, I will not say lip service, but uh, almost I'm there. Uh, so <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what I would say, uh, silencing the gun, and, and I want to close on that because I think I do agree with my sister Fatima. Uh, it's not a motto. It's really what needs to happen on the ground. And uh, with uh, La Mamra, uh, I had a conversation before the GA. And I said, with my team, we are going to count how many times silencing the gun is going to be mentioned by the African member states themselves, but also by the international community with count, and uh, we are not even at uh, 10 uh, in terms of. Uh, so if really we want to work the talk in terms of prevention, we need to make sure that uh, it is a movement where everybody believes that we can make a difference in investing uh, in uh, the various uh, streams of the work uh, with, and the roadmap of the silencing, uh, silencing the guns. Um, and uh, finally, uh, just to say, uh, the uh, establishment of the group of friends uh, in, uh, in New York, I think it is, it's a good addition uh, in terms of the for fora where we can discuss and have frank conversation because I think sometimes what uh, is missing uh, beyond the diplomatic uh, discourse is a frank conversation and being able to move uh, past those ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, an excellent point when we talk about talking, walking the talk, um, that does also entail having the talk and having the references and, and the political mobilization. I also want to note that um, we did not plan to have this much woman, peace, and security in this conversation. I was actually not initially meant to moderate, so I'm delighted to hear that it's been such a strong thread through in everybody's talking points. We have five minutes for Q&A because this conversation has been so in-depth and rich. So we'll have time for you know, sort of two, maybe three interventions from the floor, as brief as possible if you would like to make one. Um, please do give your name and organization and then we'll come back to the panelists for one minute each um, for a final reflection. So with that pressure, um, if there are any interventions from the floor at this point, comments or questions would be. This, this is your moment. Um, my name is Samir Gahigi, and I work in the, under Ms. Keita, uh, the, the Deputy Director for East Africa Division. Um, I, I was glad that uh, Sudan and South Sudan were, were, were mentioned pretty uh, numerous times by all the, the uh, panelists and also by uh, the ambassadors. Maybe uh, one question, because uh, in the issue of uh, mandate renewals, uh, Sometimes we, we, we see uh, AUPSC um, making a certain pronouncement and the Security Council not certainly departing from those pronouncements but not necessarily being a little bit aligned. Um, so the question here is how much of the role of the A3 uh, can we eventually um, expand on uh, to make sure that there is a real uh, linkage between Addis and New York when it comes to mandating certain missions. We've seen this in the context of the transition from uh, MISCA to uh, MINUSCA in Central African Republic, in Mali, and today uh, it happens time and again on certain mandates. But maybe to be concrete, 
how how can we actually progress on that? What, what can what can be done by by, for example, by the Secretariat and the AU Commission to make sure that we help uh, this alignment, if I may? Thank you. Thank you. Very yeah, Dr. Daniele, uh, International Organization for Victim Assistance. Uh, you mentioned the that women and youth would be included in the delegation. Could you expand a little more on the role of civil society? Okay, we're having a brief consultation. Um, that is basically the time that we have for Q&A, unless there are any other pressing questions. I'm going to just throw back to the panel for their uh, for their concluding thoughts on this. Um, pardon? Reverse order? That means you do have any reflections on the... Or well, I've, reflections been, I've in been general. asked civil society. Um, for me, it's, uh, it's part of uh, uh, the way we looked at the uh, forces for peace uh, on the ground. At the same time, uh, I know I'm not going to be politically correct. I don't believe that uh, civil society in itself is saint and all the others are bad. I think we have, in the context of civil society, various configurations and various entry, uh, entry points and ways uh, to support or in a constructive way or ways where it is uh, uh, co uh, obstructive to the advancement of, uh, of peace. So for me, this is uh, what I would like to, 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 to say. Um, thank you. I think um, on the issue of the uh, uh, mandate renewal and you know, what, you, uh, uh, what you are saying, I think this is all an additional gap mm -hmm. you know, uh, in addition to everything that I, else that I mentioned as far as the council to council work, uh, work is concerned. Um, but maybe what I'll do is take advantage of the fact that, uh, you know, we have a member of the A3 uh, sitting here. Um, and I'm going to probably ask, I know you're not on the panel, Ambassador Jerry, but it would be <laughs> interesting to hear your perspective, particularly um, the critical role that you play as the A3 within the Security Council on, on these issues. I've highlighted some of the gaps, but it, it would be great to hear your, your perspective on this. Thank you. Uh, well, when the boss, boss instructs the same. Look, the, 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 the A3 um, has agreed, I think, uh, to be a bridge, but also to advance the African Union um, role and issues while respecting that they were elected by membership of the United Nations, not by the African Union endorsed them, but they are elected. So, so what we have been trying to do as the A3 was to make sure that uh, this complementarity, while respecting the Charter of the United Nations and the role of Security Council, we also tried to implement uh, chapter eight to the best of our abilities to make sure that each world each understand their role, their mandate, but they must talk in board that they all have potentially a positive role to play in peace and security. So what we do from time to time with the help of our boss Fatima we look into the articulation of the African Union Summit, articulation of the Executive Council of the African Union, and articulation of the AU Peace and Security on the matters before the Security Council. And understanding the dynamics of the Security Council, we try to say to our colleague, the AU PSC means positive. It's not to undermine your authority as an overall global you know, body with peace and security. We understand that's yours and you cannot change it. After all, we are members of the United Nations, so we cannot change it. But this specific regional or continental approach, the AU can play a role before and post-conflict towards the larger issue is the continental integration of Africa, political and economic integration of Africa. So peace, 
conflict is a, is a, is a process. It's part of that um, uh, a bit of you know, unfortunate thing. But overall, overall, overall is towards an integrated Africa, peace and security in the continent. That, that is the object, that is the overall objective. Now, secondly, you have the P5, permanent members, who deal with this file continuously. Take the DRC, they've been there 20 years. We come two years ago, two years ago. So they've developed some form of uh, understanding among themselves on how to manage these files. So our role is to say we are matured in Africa, we have political will in Africa, we have matured institutions in Africa, we have the capabilities in Africa, and we want to lay down our lives for peace and security in Africa. Give us a chance. Give us a chance. What you should do, complement while you are overall. So that is where the whole thing lies. And I think we are getting there. I think we are getting there. Especially as I was saying, use the issue of women, peace and security as an oxygen to this to these issues. I think we are getting there. Now there was this morning a question of um, uh, role of civil society. There is just no way, not, not the country, no way. There is no way you can complete the management, the dealing of global peace and security without ordinary people, without women. So you see, increasingly there is a um, invitation of grassroots women, activists to come and brief security council. It's a realization that if all and done, they, they might be the catalyst, catalyst for change, civil society. Uh, look at the Arab Spring. Uh, look what is happening in uh, some parts of our continent uh, and, and elsewhere uh, in Europe. I was saying to somebody in Ukraine, the new leader is not from established party, right? In Ukraine. It's not. It's a young person. But it's, it's the role of ordinary people, civil society. So they, they have become a major force on global political. Uh, uh, so you cannot ignore it. So, um, uh, 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 Bintu, you know, I think the, the way to do it is to be having them around the table while understanding each other's role. That you are intergovernmental with responsibility but they have definitive major role to play in dealing with peace and security or even developing new agenda questions. <laughs> Boss, did I answer that question? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. Any final? We have some final concluding comments from Gustavo. Yes. Dear Ambassadors, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when we started to do this work, uh, around a year ago in discussions between the ISS being based in South Africa and IPI being based in New York, our first question was how can we make this relevant? Uh, as, as think tanks, our work is not just to produce research. We are, we, we're not in academia, we're not in university, and then even though we do our research to be based in evidence, to be based on strong methodology, we really focus on our work to ensure that our primary beneficiaries are then receiving the, 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 the products that they require, that they need to strengthen this agenda. But also there was the discussion, which is quite relevant for, for, for the type of discussions around UN and EU relations. What are the complementarities between different organizations? Being the ISS, a southern-based organization, and IPI, a northern-based organization, we really felt that there was a sense of complementarity that the two institutions could bring to this process, both in terms of physical presence, views of the world. Because at the end of the day, these discussions are not easy. And I think all of the, the speakers raised to many of the challenges and opportunities that exist within making uh, the UN and the African Union to work better together. And I wanted to touch what, uh, what Ambas Ambassador Matilo mentioned right in his opening remarks and the question of how do we get Africa to realize its full potentials? And I think that is a critical question. When we are in a moment that is becoming almost cliche to say that multilateralism is at stake, 
it becomes very clear that for the weaker countries, and we all, many countries here, Ambassador from Norway, Ambassador from South Africa, mentioned the idea of being small countries. For these countries is why multilateralism matters the most. Because together they can be stronger, they can be more effective, and they can be able to have a greater impact when it comes to their own outcomes globally, and to be able to work with the most powerful countries to also ensure that the collective goods are being better delivered. But that is also important when you talk about the role of two multilateral organizations like the UN and the AU. It's also almost a cliche to say that no organization can do everything alone. And these two organizations show really well since the creation of the Africa Union in 2002, and even before with the Organization for Africa Unity, that by working together, they can actually advance more the agenda and the discussions. So our speakers well mentioned many of the developments around the partnership between the two organizations, especially since the joint framework in 2017. We spoke about the, the, the council to council meetings, the desk to desk, uh, the role of the AUPAC and the UN Security Council coming together not only during the visits, the emerging group of friends and from our side and working in others very closely, seeing that group of friends and others is important not just for UN AU relations, but also how multilateralism works in Addis Ababa. For you in New York, you may think that groups of friends is something that you see at all times and, and for all subjects. For us in others, that is not, an, that, that, that is not a, a, a established dynamics. So that is very important. But also we increasingly see how actors like the A3, and, and, and I think having the ambassador of South Africa here is very important, considering the efforts the country made to bring those those three countries together within the Security Council can create a new modality of cooperation between the two organizations, mm -hmm. the cooperation that comes from within. When you have the three African members coming with joint positions, and we don't know when was the last year that we've seen so many joint statements uh, like this year, this is extremely important because you increase leverage and links to my first comment around why multilateralism matters for smaller states. We've seen in many occasions where that leverage that comes not only because the A3 had a joint position, but particularly because the A3 used the common position from Addis Ababa to strengthen the role of the Security Council. This is of critical importance. And of course, there is a disproportionate focus on, focus on peacekeeping in our discussions. And that is both a challenge and an opportunity. To some extent, the fact that peacekeeping is a relevant tool help us to identify what are the key mechanisms and what are the key challenges that we have to address conflicts uh, in Africa. But at the same time, peacekeeping is not a panacea. It's not something that can be done for everything, and we're very clear for that. So just to conclude, uh, I think that what our speakers said really highlights the issue around collaboration and coordination really well. But also highlights to us that collaboration and coordination is not easy. We're not always going to have the same points of view. We don't always have the same points of views even within the continent itself. We see often some kind of disagreements between the A3 and the PSC, and we see some kind of agreements between certain AU actors and certain UN actors, and that's normal. But I don't think that's what collaboration and coordination is about. Collaboration and coordination is about building trust, mutual knowledge, reduce dissonance in a very difficult world. And much can be done united. What is next? And I think I wanted to, for 30 seconds, if you allow me, just to, I think 2020 will really give us a lot of opportunity for this agenda. Considering that the theme of the year for the African Union is silence the guns, and most of us spoke about it, there is a great opportunity to move away from the debate simply being on peacekeeping. The silence in the guns agenda talks about uh, much broader and multi-layered approaches to deal with conflicts in, in, in the continent. And having one of the A3 members also chairing the Africa Union is of critical importance. The peace building review here in New York will provide a lot of opportunities in an area that not only the PBC has issues around visibility, but also the post-conflict reconstruction and development at the AU that has gained a lot of momentum in the last few years have then dealt with that. From our side, we would like to continue supporting the AU, the United Nations, and member states on this process. We don't see this as a once-off because we don't do research for the sake of research. So I'd like to thank you once again 
uh, on behalf of ISS, and I believe from IPI as well, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Remember, multilateralism, walking the talk, silencing the guns, parenthood. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.